Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. For listening to the Futurati podcast. Tonight we're joined by Rick Ferguson. Rick is Vice President of Security Research at Trend Micro and is actively engaged in studying online threats and the underground economy. He also researches the wider implications of new developments in the information technology arena and their impact on security. If you enjoy this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. So Rick, thanks for coming on the show here today. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Now, we're talking to you in Warsaw, and that's um, arguably real close to the war front. And there's lots of things going on over there that uh, were unanticipated. Can you explain why uh, cybersecurity has become kind of an interesting factor in the, in the battle between the Ukraine and Russia? Cyber has, has played a role in this conflict, that's for sure. Um, but it's nowhere near to the the scope or the extent I think that people have been expecting for the last decade or more. Um, definitely, I, I think if you if you go back in time not too far, you'll find a bunch of quotes of the, along the lines of that the next war will be fought in cyberspace. Uh, and I think this this war, this conflict, um, is proving that that's not the case. Battles are still fought on the ground using. Uh, explosives and bullets and people and machines. Um, so cyber has been most notable in this conflict by its absence rather than by its presence. That's not to say it's not happening at all. It is happening, but it's happening in very limited, very specific ways. Um, and that, there's a there's a number of possible reasons that that's the case, which I'm happy to to go into if you want to. Yeah. So. Uh uh, there's been a lot of reports on how the information the Russian government is putting out is radically different from what's actually going on. Um, is it a possibility that the the tech people, the cybersecurity people over there, are actually getting the the true read on what the the actual conflict is looking like from the the rest of the world's viewpoint? Uh, instead of what the Russian government is, and they're they're unwilling to do the things they're being told to do. Is that a possibility? That's more than a possibility. So I have uh, friends, uh, colleagues. Um, Trend Micro had a, obviously a Russian office before all of this happened. Uh, but I have friends and colleagues uh, in Russia who I know are making full use of uh, technologies like VPN uh, or Tor web browsers, for example, to maintain their access to online assets, which nominally they have been cut off from. Um, so there is no question in my mind that information is making it through this kind of digital blockade that that, uh, that they've instituted in Russia. It's a question of, um, it's not a question of whether the information makes it through. I think it's a question of whether the, the people it makes it through to want to believe it or not. And okay. I, isn't that always the, the biggest question <clears throat> when it comes to uh, you know, propaganda, influence operations, and so on. If you're speaking, if you're, if you're leaning against an open door, then then that's great. But if 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 you're trying to make someone believe something that they find inherently impossible or inherently false, um, you're not going to have any success. And and no greater testament to that than the fact that people living in Ukraine and actually you know, we we have Ukrainian refugees living with us. We have since the start of the conflict not just one family, several. Um, and I know from, from direct conversations with them that the, the grandmother, for example, of one of these families uh, believes the Russian government, she's in, in, in not, not in Ukraine and not with us, so she believes what the Russian government is telling her and completely disbelieves what her own family is telling her is the reality on the ground from eyewitness testimony. <clears throat> so the great wow. challenge, I think, is not in getting the information through. That's happening for sure. It's a question of how effective the propaganda is at home in Russia. 
uh, yeah. and how effective the, the 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 propaganda has been up until this date as well. This wasn't just a a sudden flash in the pan conflict. This was a long time in the planning. So I just looked up online, and it says that the uh, that Warsaw, where you're uh, speaking to us from, uh, the population is 1.7 million people. Um, can you talk a little bit about how uh, the refugees have influenced the population there, and what percentage are, have come from Russia, and what percentage have come from the Ukraine? Uh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, I think 1.7 million is is like uh, Warsaw City proper, but if you take in the whole metropolitan area, it's it's uh, greater than that. So, when we say that the the last statistic I heard is that the population of Warsaw, since the outbreak of this conflict, so it's a very short time uh, span, has increased by 20 percent. Um, then I, I, I'm not sure if that's the 1.7 million or the larger figure of the whole metropolitan area. Nonetheless, it's a 20 percent increase. Um, and right. and you know, numbers are, are not as relevant, I think, when you're talking about how does the city scale up infrastructure? Right. How does the city scale <laughs> up facilities, accommodation, all of those things for, for the people that are arriving? Um, they have come from Ukraine. We on paper, uh, we have a border with Russia, but it's a tiny little, it's Kaliningrad, which is a very small outpost of Russia. It's not actually okay. physically, geographically joined onto Russia. So while we have a, a, an on paper border with Russia, it's not with Russia proper. Um, we have welcomed um, more than 2 million refugees uh, from Ukraine into Poland. Um, and the, the huge majority of those are being welcomed in, into homes like this one. Uh, where private citizens are just saying, okay, you need a place to be, that place can be here uh, uh, for as long as it needs to be. Um, and that's the reality of what's happening on the ground. We just took a whole bunch of donations this morning to um, what used to be an expo center. And it's funny because the donations all came from Trend Micro's uh, marketing cupboards. And many people watching might be familiar with that. The marketing department have a cupboard where they keep all of their goodies that they give away at events. Uh, USB chargers and, and, and cables and T-shirts and promotional first aid kits and all kinds of stuff. So we asked all our colleagues at Trend to go through those cupboards, box up everything that would be a suitable donation and send it to us here at our home. And we took it all uh, this morning to one of the, the this expo center, which is now housing more than 5,000 people in temporary accommodation inside the expo hall. So those are the kinds of things that are happening. Um, the impact is is real. Um, you know, we just hope that it's it's not going to be uh, too long uh, lasting right, you know, right. in terms of for, for those Ukrainians. We want them to be able to go home because I know even from the people that have stayed with us, they, they, they're refugees. They've been forced to leave the country they live in. And the most important lesson for me is they're people just like us. They had totally normal, professional, normal lives before this happened. Um, some of them have places to go, other countries, family in other countries, and, and that's what we're helping people to do from here. Um, but without exception, they all want to go back, they all want to rebuild, and they all want to do it as soon as possible. So let's just hope for that. Yeah, I can see that <clears throat> it's difficult at this moment in time to actually gain any realistic expectations about what will be happening uh, to end the war in, in Ukraine, but I've, I've heard lots of reports about how the, the tech world is, uh, Russia is going through this massive brain drain as lots of uh, tech people who have actually gotten a true message of what's going on over there have yep. just decided to bail. And they've, yeah. they've gone to countries all over the world. Um, so with, with a massive brain drain like that, I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible to actually um, uh, talk through <clears throat> what effect that's going to have on a country long term, but um, it, it would sure make me me suspect of ever going back again if I if I left the country under those uh, uh, those terms. I think um, as a nation, Russia is going to have a long way to go, as you say, to recover from this in every conceivable way. Uh, international standing, one thing. But yes, definitely the, the brain drain phenomenon, the loss of 
of qualified professionals who are crossing the border on foot, uh, crossing the border in vehicles to places like Finland, for example, um, and then that's a gateway into the the, the rest of the EU, uh, or maybe even they're making a, a longer journey, uh, maybe to your shores. Um, that's absolutely happening. And countries like like Poland actually were already kind of a tech hub within the EU. Lots of uh, cloud work here, lots of data centers here. Um, so the the government here has made it very easy for for those people to get a social security number, there's no barriers in place, they have the right to live, the right to work, the right to stay. Um, many people won't want to go back, that's absolutely for sure. And we're already seeing implications of sanctions on, you know, hard hardware type technology, um, not being able to be exported to companies that are that are building technology within Russia, uh, financial sanctions, making it impossible for people to pay. Um, but also the the lasting effect of sanctions on corporate reputation, I think, is one that will be the hardest to shake off. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be throwing stones, but it is not a good look right now to be a Russian cybersecurity company. And there are plenty <laughs> of news stories that that you know, evidence that. And actually there are, if you were to get into the details, I'm sure with a lot of competing vendors, there are probably a lot of financial stories to tell that tale as well. Well, it seems like um, on the cybersecurity front, uh, there's uh, talent that can weigh in from kind of all corners of the planet. And, and there's ways of masking your trail so nobody knows where it comes from. Uh, is is that kind of a logical next front on the on the war that's going to be happening? So we we like I said at the, at the beginning, we cyber has been notable by its absence really in this conflict, particularly when you bear in mind the, the fact that people were expecting significantly more. Um, there are I was trying to like sort of logic my way through it uh, and, and try and work out why that's the case, and I came up with three overriding reasons why I think that's the case. Um, the first is about expectations pre-conflict. So that is Putin uh, and his cadre of, of uh, military or intelligence officials expecting a quick victory. Uh, it, I think it's become pretty clear that this wasn't supposed to be a long, drawn-out conflict. Um, if you expect a quick victory, would it be sensible to use uh, cyber attacks to disable large sections of technology or economy? Probably not. You want to be able to walk in, install a new government, and carry on as if nothing had happened and say, hey, this was always mine, right? That, that's yeah. kind of what the Russian expectation was. <laughs> um, so that's one potential reason. Another is the, the paranoia of the Russian regime certainly seems to have led to Putin not sharing his plans with as many people as you would possibly normally expect. That's ranging from soldiers on the front line who thought they were on exercises right up until the moment they were told to cross the border, all the way through the military command and intelligence circles. People just didn't know this was coming. Um, if Putin's red team didn't know that this was coming, then they didn't have the time that it, that is necessary, the required time to do the upfront preparation for a successful cyber intrusion campaign uh, especially a destructive one if you want to do things like they've done in the past, like degrade um, electricity generation and distribution capability, which they've done twice in Ukraine, um, you need time to prepare that. And if you are not forewarned, there is absolutely no way that you can be prepared to do that. So that could be another really, uh, really strong reason. But I think when I was going through and I came to the last one and I went, actually, I think this is probably it. This is what's become the reality. Um because they did start with a small cyber attack, it timed exactly on the day that the invasion took place, which was against ground infrastructure um, for satellite communications for KASAT, which is owned by, by Viasat, where they bricked a bunch of ground modems that were used for this satellite comms. And it did have a measurable effect on, on Ukrainian capability at the time, which they overcame. So cyber was definitely a component but as the conflict, it became clear quite quickly that this wasn't going to go as initially planned. Obviously, the, the Russian willingness to simply destroy infrastructure kind of renders cyber obsolete, useless. If, if you can shell it, if you can bomb it, why would you bother cybering it? If your goal is to degrade Ukrainian TV broadcasting capability, for example, then as they have done, you blow up the TV broadcasting tower. There's There's no requirement to be you know for stealth or finesse when you're already prepared 
to commit war crimes and and bomb civilian infrastructure. So do you think Russia's uh, prepared for a cyber backlash though? I mean, the- Clearly not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, clearly not. That that's It's been interesting to watch those things happen. So Ukraine obviously have been recruiting their volunteer cyber army um, throughout the conflict so far, and that continues, continues to be effective. There is um, opposition forces within Belarus, or Belarusia, um, who are critical of their own government's collaboration with, with the Russian government in this conflict, who are also taking action, uh, and even people within Russia. So, you know, that's there have been people, for example, within the FSB who have been leaking details of Russian plans to Ukrainians so that they could be thwarted assassination attempts on Valensky, for example. Um, we've seen examples of uh, the, the Ukraine... Uh, the official Ukrainian cyber forces leaking uh, a huge number of details about active FSB agents spread uh, throughout the world to the extent of, you know, there were comments on some of the files like drinks uh, often uh, has traffic violations associated with the, the details of the people that were being effectively just being doxxed. It's kind of anonymous slash, you know, lulsec uh, uh. type behavior, right? Um, and then just... Today, I was reading a news story about the opposition within within Belarusia, uh, who have leaked information from the Belarusian Postal Service, the details of the Russians who have been using Russian soldiers who have been using Belarusian postal services to send looted goods back to their families in Russia, oh, um, wow. which in itself, although minor, is still a war crime, right. looting of civilian <laughs> goods and homes and, and property and so on. So. All of this will continue to add to that, the evidence gathering um, uh, process that will surround the whole, you know, which war crimes were committed, by whom, when, how, and so on, and eventually hopefully lead to prosecution. So the cyber backlash is ongoing and it's real. It's a rolling thunder. It's not a, it's not a thunder clap, it's a rolling thunder. Uh, and I think it will continue and it will continue to grow in scale throughout the the conflict, however long that goes on for. I, I wanted to get to your reaction to a third hypothesis that I've heard floated around, and I believe this came mm. from Hidden Forces by Dmitry Kofanas, and I forget the, the guest who postulated this, but their view is that part of the problem in this analysis is that when we consider Russian cybercrime, we see it as sort of a monolith. There's just these Russian hackers who are doing all this stuff. But in fact, some of the cybercrime comes directly from the state. Some of it comes from private actors that are state sponsored or state sanctioned in yes. some way. And then some of it comes from just other Russian groups that the state may have nothing to do with. And then in yeah. fact, we've been overestimating the capability of the Russian state to wage cyber warfare in a manner analogous to the way we've overestimated its actual armed forces to wage warfare. We've all been kind of surprised at how bad the logistics have been and how bad the planning has been. So do you think there's anything to that thesis that actually the Russian state just doesn't have that much cyber crime capacity, that most of the really sophisticated stuff comes from private groups that may be associated with the state but aren't acting directly on its behalf? So overall, they're, they're dumber than they appear to they're be. They're dumber than... <laughs> less, less competent. I think there's less a lot to it. I think there's a lot of validity to that. I mean, it's certainly the case that um, Russian financial career cyber criminals have always been co-opted by the state for specific operations or for specific skills or for specific knowledge. You know, it's, it wouldn't, it, more than once we've seen the FSB in a blaze of headlines arresting uh, a prominent cyber criminal uh, and then that cyber criminal kind of disappearing from view rather than going on trial. And, and you have to draw your own conclusions about what actually happened there because right. there's no other information available. When you think about you know, what has some of Russia's maybe most effective capability mm -hmm. been that, that is arguably directly nation-driven, uh, it's probably in the influence operations arena rather than in the, um, the cyber attack and disruption arena, although that's, you know, there are exceptions to that. But the most broadly globally successful stuff is kind of the St. Petersburg troll farm stuff, right, that's been the going on for several years now. Botnets and uh, influence operations through social media, those those kinds of activities. And, and th I mean, there's a huge future for that. If we think about where does that, you know, where does that live in the metaverse? What do influence operations look like? In, I know I use the word. I'm already sorry. I'm already <laughs> slapping myself. Um, um, but, but if you think about an influence operation of today is 
it's at arm's length, right? You have some kind of distance to the the post that you're reading or the reactions that you're seeing, the sharing of that post. If it becomes an immersive um, 360, possibly even a visceral um, uh, experience, um, our emotional and rational ability to reason it and to deal with it will be very, very different. And we do have to think about that now because, you know, meta or not, um, that much more immersive web is coming. That's that's an unavoidable thing. What I think is really funny about it is we're going to skip Ready Player One entirely because we're not going to need those the full body haptic suits <laughs> right. because we'll already be talking about direct neural link. So what, if you have a neural link, you don't need the, the full body suit. Um, <laughs> but so, so yes, the influence ops, I think they're good at and they prove they're good at that. And they have had measurable global societal effects uh, even on in, in as smaller entities as my own family when it comes to Brexit and much more global scale when it comes to, to politics and, and uh, nationalist movements and those kinds of things. But when I said there are also exceptions, when you think about groups like Sandworm, that's nation state capability and they have led you know, directly kind of sabotage campaigns against critical national infrastructure, specifically in Ukraine. But for most of the rest of it, there's an awful lot of crossover between financial criminals uh, and um, and state mm -hmm. cyber capability. And I think that became very apparent when at the outbreak of hostilities, at the invasion of Ukraine, um, you saw certain criminal groups publicly taking sides. The groups like Con the Conti ransomware group saying, hey, we support Russia, and if anyone gets in our way, we'll be coming after you. Yeah. Um, so it became the, the the level of alignment between career cyber crime and nation state activity became very clear very quickly. Could could I ask you a follow up on the the influence ops and the narrative engineering piece? You you said that the Russian government has evinced rather a lot of capability in that area, and I know that especially with the 2016 election, there was just you know people going on and on and on about how the Russians had influenced it, and they were engaging in these really really targeted campaigns aimed at swing voters, and you had the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal, yep. and yep. I, I believe there's a certain amount of that, but I've also heard you know reasonably convincing counter arguments that actually the bots didn't have that much penetration, and 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 yeah, there was there were some impressions, and probably people's opinions were swayed one way or another, but it doesn't look like it was really such a large scale thing. It wasn't, they weren't literally moving the tectonic plates of society around to engineer an outcome they wanted. So given that you're an expert in this area, I just thought maybe you would weigh in on that. Do, do you think that, look, go ahead. Yeah. I, I think like tectonic plates that things move very slowly to the point where even if you go stand in Iceland with, you know, and you can look at the North American plate from the European plate, nothing is moving. If you stand there and look at it, nothing is moving. Nonetheless, it's moving. Um, and that's undeniably evidenced <clears throat> with the fullness of time. Right. Um, I I kind of had, I don't know if it's a privileged or, or more of a unique position on being able to see that change. Uh, and this is, a, this is a totally personal story, but I think it's more than anecdotal. Um, I left the UK before Brexit was a big deal. Right? And Brexit for me is the 2016 election for you. That it's the, right. the same like... Right. How did that happen? Like, what made that happen? Um, you know, whether you support it or not, it's really interesting to look at the dynamic of how did that happen? Because it both of them were unexpected outcomes mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, when I left the UK, nobody cared. Nobody cared about nobody cared about me leaving. That's true, but nobody cared about Brexit <laughs> either, right? So it it wasn't a conversation that we were having in the pub. It wasn't a conversation that we were having in my family. It just wasn't a conversation we were having unless you were a member of the Conservative Party in the Houses of Parliament. And they've been arguing about it for decades. So business as usual. I left the country. I went to live abroad. I lived abroad for nearly five years and actually <laughs> moved back in 2016, um, about three months before the, the referendum. Good times. And I didn't recognise the place. I, I, you know, like you don't see people getting older unless you don't see them for a long time. And then you come back and go, wow, you've gone gray or something like that. Right. That's, that's what happened. That's what happened. I came back and I looked at my country and the people <laughs> that lived there and went, you've changed. Um, <laughs> because the, the substance of the dialogue was different, which is fine. But the, the quality of the dialogue was different. People actually weren't having dialogue. People were having individual monologues and trying to harangue other people into their perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no idea 
where this schism had come from, this it's huge division in society had come from, and this isolation within your own point of view had come from. Because people who previously were much more interested in what beer they were going to have next were now foaming at the mouth Brexiteers or foaming at the mouth Remainers or whatever. Right. It had become this massively divisive issue. And if, as I had stepped out of it for a certain period of time to step back in, it had come from out of nowhere. And I think if I had been in the country, I wouldn't have even seen it happening. And I think that's the real truth about influence ops that are successful. They're the ones you don't notice. If you can measure them, they're doing it wrong. Right. It's it's the very subtle ones that are just kind of in the air that you're breathing that are really Yeah, effective. and it's not it's not that you you you're gonna measure the botnet activity and say, wow, look at all of these fake accounts that are retweeting almost word for word all of this content that's clearly being generated in St. Petersburg. If that's happening, it's a really rubbish campaign. Mm -hmm. But if it's permeating its way through other people's regular organic activity on social media, then it's hugely successful. When I see people um, who lived in the same village as me and who were friends of mine after I'd moved back there with my, my wife, who was not English, sharing content, and they're friends of my wife, who's not English, uh, sharing content like our National Health Service is, is a, British, uh, a British service for British people. Right. And my pregnant wife's going, my, my friend just, just shared that. People themselves don't realize what has happened to their thought process and how how inward they have turned and how unable to consider i suppose it's a lack of empathy and a lack of nuance they're the two things that that have been most affected by influence operations a lack of empathy and a lack of nuance i agree yeah so over, over time we've heard we always hear in when a war breaks out there's there's mercenaries that come into play from one angle or another um but it seems like we've we've kind of given rise to uh, a new group of cyber mercenaries, uh, the people that are kind of lurking in the background. You just don't hear much about, and and whoever wants to pay this group, they're uh, they're out for the highest, uh, uh, the most money they can possibly make in the shortest period of time. Um, are are you kind of aware of this type of activity? Are, are does anybody out identify as cyber mercenaries out there, and uh, and how big a factor is that in in the war that's going on today? In this particular conflict, I I don't think that's really a thing. I mean, we have published some research relatively recently about um, you know hackers for hire, cyber mercenaries uh, in effect. That is an established part of the underground economy, uh, but I think in in a situation as polarizing as basically a state-on-state full-blown war, which is what what we're what we're seeing right now, is on one side, uh, depending on your perspective, right? On one side is the good guys, and the other side is the bad guys. Hopefully, most people get that the right way around. Right. But if <laughs> if you're supporting the good guys, then you're going to volunteer, and and we're seeing that happening. If you're in the country of the bad guys, I don't think you get the choice. It, it, it's, I mean. If you're in Russia, they don't have to offer you money to make you do things. Right. They just tell you to do things. Right. Yeah, but I would think that there's um, people in other countries around the world that don't want uh, the country itself doesn't want to be identified as being part of this war. Um, they they don't want to fall out of favor with Putin, but they can contribute money to a, uh, underground money to a mercenary group that could actually um, weigh in and do some significant damage. Um, yeah, I think the possibility is there. I don't. I don't think we've seen it reflected in reality, um, and I think m maybe some of the you know more forward-looking. When does this really become an issue? When do we really have to be concerned? Is when w warfare evolves, and I actually think that this conflict will be a, an inflection point in warfare uh, because it's very clear that this isn't the future war we were expecting. Right. I think that's really clear. Um, so I think it will be an inflection point where you know, nations will say, okay, how do we wage this future war? Because we can't, you know, if, if we want to have effective military operations, we can't get bogged down in, in World War II type conflict, which is what we're seeing, you know, tanks right. advancing across fields. Um, so right. I think this will be an inflection point in that era. Um, and a, a big area of concern for me, and this is where I think cyber will play a, a huge role in future, is when um, states begin to invest in development of and deployment of 
uh, artificially intelligent kinetic weaponry. So not remotely piloted drones, which is what we're seeing in this conflict and, and previous ones, but imagine you know a weapon that you can throw up in the air and it will do reconnaissance work, select targets and engage according to the algorithms that it was born with. Um, if you have uh, the, 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 the capability to influence the operations of your adversaries, uh, independent artificially intelligent kinetic weaponry, um, that will be a huge area of uh, research investment, let's say, for cyber operations within, within nation states. I wanted to ask you about another potential inflection point, another way in which this conflict is kind of unique, and that is the role that has been played by blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies. So it's already being heralded as the first crypto war, and there's all this speculation about the possibility of Putin and his oligarchs, the ones who've been directly sanctioned, shielding their assets by putting them in cryptocurrencies, possibly evading the sanctions altogether by using cryptocurrencies. And then there's also the converse situation in which people have donated something like $100 million to uh, Ethereum addresses, Bitcoin addresses, and POCA addresses that are controlled by the Ukrainian government. So uh, I, I don't know that it is that the role crypto is playing is as big as some of the speculators would have it, but it does seem to be playing a role that has never been seen before. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, the the sanctions i think were more far reaching uh and faster than uh the the subjects of those sanctions had expected mm -hmm. um so there wasn't time for them to 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 prepare uh next time around though uh think you know cryptocurrencies will play a much greater role in helping people to park money out of sight um you know right now it was in yachts and things which are quite easy to seize as it turns out <laughs> um but i think again lessons are learned from from this conflict and and crypto will will play a bigger it does play a role already for sure like you say we're seeing donations flowing in and there is no doubt that crypto is being used for sanctions busting to some degree um but by and large i think sanctions are being effective this time around they that won't be the case next time and crypto is is very much the reason for that do you have any thoughts about how it might be possible to handle that in the future how to, how to structure blockchain technologies or privacy preserving technology i have in mind monero maybe such that you could still have the sanctions be effective but we're not snooping around in people's personal details i don't, I don't know that it's possible i just off the cuff what do you think yeah i mean so there, there are some things i, mean, I think as we see um crypto evolved to mainstream and i mean by mainstream i mean government levels of acceptability and we start to see nations having their own digital currency cryptocurrency which is aligned to their fiat currency um we will see cryptocurrencies that don't offer anonymity and i think that will that will definitely be something that that, that surfaces in fact we mention it very specifically in the in the project 2030 research in our imaginary country of New San Joban, they have exactly that, a cryptocurrency that doesn't offer anonymity. And we look at what the impact of that might be on criminal markets, uh, what the impact of that might be on old fashioned cash even. Um, uh, but the other thing I think that's really interesting when it comes to cryptocurrency um, is the other innovations in that area, in, you know, in the blockchain area and NFTs more recently, um, that are eroding the anonymity of cryptocurrency and blockchain just by the fact that they have to coexist because open source intelligence now allows you to identify the owner of a wallet if they have bought and display something as unique as an nft for example um, so as more technologies grow and coexist within that crypto arena of blockchain of nft of cryptocurrency um then the capabilities of osint for effectively tracking down the activities of people leveraging those infrastructures will grow exponentially and we we know the value of osint in combating cybercrime traditionally anyway it's one of the most effective tools and as more open source intelligence becomes available in that crypto realm the less anonymous that whole realm becomes which from a law enforcement perspective is a very good thing. Yeah, um, as as the conflict drags on, 
uh, what's what's the likelihood? Uh, there's there's got to be a certain point where Putin no longer can remain in power. Um, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and nobody quite knows what the duration has to be to reach that point. But he's he's surrounded himself. He's insulated himself with a, uh, a lot of like-minded people that um, are, are kind of uh, keep, keeping him out of uh, harm's way, so to speak. Um, is it would seem like there there's ways of actually piercing this um, kind of this physical body of people that are uh, supporting him. Um, has have you given any thought to to what that looks like? I mean, you're you're right in the middle of this conflict. You're right in the middle of uh, all the refugees coming and staying with you, and and so it would seem like um, uh, people in that group are are staying up at night trying to figure out uh, how do we how do we do things different? How do we this this is an entire new breed of war? So why don't we uh, come at it from a completely different vantage point? Um, is, are, do you have any thoughts in that area? Yeah, I, I, I think it's it's you know readily apparent that Putin has has painted himself into a corner with stated aims and this conflict. There is no easy way out for him, and and nor should there be. I mean, I'm I'm kind of that's 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 exactly as it should be. Although it ups the stakes, um, there is much greater scope for more significant retaliation the, the more that someone is cornered. I mean, that's an old truism, right? The, the cornered right. dog is going to be the, the, the most vicious one. Um, so that that's a concern that's always top of mind. But I was reading a very interesting piece recently about the structure of, of the coterie that surrounds Putin. You know, he has on one side, he has the oligarchs and on the other side, he has the strong men and he, they're pitted against one another. So, you know, he's, he's a very clever effective dictator right he's a very he's a very clever tyrant and he's done it by the book which is that you surround yourself with people who believe that the only person that they can trust is you uh, and it makes it very difficult for them then to be able to talk to one another to affect any change um, because no one knows who they can trust but to be honest if it can happen in the ussr it can happen in the russian federation and we just have to hope that that, that day comes sooner rather than later the sanctions, I think, will play a key role. Um, I think in two ways, a population, there's a whole generation that's grown up in a country where they don't have to queue for everything, where the shops are full, where rubles buy things. And my experience of, of traveling to Moscow in the past is that, you know, it was a culture rich uh, and Moscow itself. I know wider Russia is not Moscow uh, economically by, by a long stretch of the imagination, but it was a culture rich Eastern allegory to the Western society that I had grown up in. It wasn't very different. And there's a whole generation of Russians who've grown up in that country. They won't want to say goodbye to that. Uh, and the oligarchs won't want to say goodbye to the European lifestyles and European houses um, that, that they had enjoyed up until this point. And it looks like the, the only possible outcomes is either a change to the way that regime is structured brought about from the inside or Russia turns into a gigantic North Korea with even more nuclear weapons and capability than, than North Korea has right now. Uh, I know which one I would, would rather have. Uh, and I think that the people who have grown up in a, in a, a westernized society and the people who have worked themselves into a position of oligarchy also wouldn't want to live in a giant North Korea. I find that comment about Putin's ability to balance different dynamics and different interest groups really compelling. It's fascinating to me that not that long ago, there was this whole war that was waged in Chechnya, and now some of his most ardent supporters actually come from there, in part because he was smart enough to install a strongman yep. that, that rules sort of by proxy and is loyal to Putin specifically and has had free reign to kind of manage the country as he sees fit. And now that's a source of some of their, their strongest supporters. And also you, you note that the sanctions will have an impact on the oligarchs. And I, I've been reading a little bit about the oligarchy in Russia and studying the question a little bit. And one of the more interesting 
data points that I've come across is that there's actually two different sets of oligarchs that we sort of lump together. One is this group of oligarchs that arose in the early 1990s after the Soviet Union fell and the economy was kind of liberalized, but it was not handled very well. And essentially they just yeah. auctioned off ent entire industries. And so these people were there and they had enough rubles to kind of get in on the action and now they're oligarchs. And there's another set that has that is joined at the hip with Putin and has been sort of his loyal coterie from the very beginning. And they're not quite the same group and they don't have the exact same loyalties. They don't have the exact same incentives, but our sanctions kind of target both groups blanketly. And so it's not clear that we'll get, you know, we'll get an equal cash payout as a result of that. So I, I don't know if you have any responses to that. Yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, we, we're, we're targeting Russian money and the people who wield Russian money. And of course, that's both of the groups that, that you just referred to. And we're targeting Russian power and the people who wield Russian power. And those are the strong, that's the strongman group, right? Uh, that, that also he surrounds himself with it and uh, they interact with. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't move in MI5 circles, um, but I'm not convinced that, that we have the nuance to know where change would come from because a lot of the thing that we're trying to lever with sanctions in, in this particular respect, not in its totality, but in this particular respect, is greed. And I and that's you need to know an individual extremely well to know exactly what point of leverage you need for, for something as emotional as that. Um, and it's not clear. Everything in in the Russia of today and the Russia of recent times, everything is within Putin's gift and has been for, for quite a significant time. So even if you're an oligarch who enriched themselves in the 90s, if you're still an oligarch right right now, it's because you're allowed to be. It's not because you have a lot of money. It's because you're allowed to keep that money. Mm -hmm. um, everything is with, within the gift of, of the leader, right? So we need to target all of them equally because I don't think we have the 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 the, the nuanced level of of clarity about where potential change could come from. That we have no option but to say. One of you's got to give in some way or another. One of you's got to give. Yeah, we'll punish all of you together, and that incentivizes you to break ranks if you can, if you want the pain to stop. Yeah, I would. I would think that Putin goes to bed with a <clears throat> increasing level of paranoia every night. That uh, <clears throat> he's worried about people out out to get him, and uh, literally they are. Um, so I, I would think that this is. Um, kind of driving a level of insanity that um, most people can't relate to. I, I don't know how you kind of mentally insulate yourself from um, uh, kind of opposing forces in something like this. Uh, but I guess I've never been a tyrant, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm doing 16-8 fasting, so I just go to bed thinking about food. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's probably better. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's an interesting dynamic, right? You you tend to see this play out pretty reliably when you've got an autark or or a tyrant of one form or another, and and it's not that they're crazy. Like there are people out to get them. You have to know that when you're in charge in this way and you're as hated as somebody like Putin is, or or where you've got some segments of the population that adore you and some that obviously hate you. Like you'd have to be crazy to not know that that latter group exists and that they would like to depose you in some way. So it's it's not as though it's insanity. It, it's totally, it, it's a reasonable assessment of the situation, but it's got to eat away at you after a while. Well, we've all seen the, the size of the tables that he's been sitting at recently, right? right? And how far <laughs> away he's been from, from the people he's shouting down the table. Yeah. How's the war going? <laughs> Terribly. Like, yeah. So th there's, a, there's a question we've kind of been alluding to throughout the conversation, and I wanted to pull back and just ask it bluntly and, and kind of get your broad thoughts on it. And that's just the future of warfare. So we've discussed cryptocurrencies. We've discussed cybercrime. We've discussed some of the ways in which the World War II model of tanks advancing across the plane is probably outdated. We've talked a little bit about artificial intelligence. Obviously, there are things like bioweapons that could be targeted at specific genetic populations, and the list just kind of goes on and on. So what are your generic thoughts about the future of war? Yeah, I mean, you kind of just listed them, so that... <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, so obviously advances in, in AI over the past, uh, well, several decades, to be honest, um, like everything, it, it, it only everything in life only ever accelerates, including the amount of gray hair on your head. But everything in life only ever accelerates. And if we look at what the the potential for AI is uh, over the next decade, then I think influence ops will be the biggest one because 
Um, if you can have a campaign that that works through belief, through inf influencing the way that people think, the things that people believe, and you never have to lift a weapon or fire a missile, uh, then your victory has the potential to be far more lasting than if you had to take something by force. So m more investment. We will we will grow up. This is the interesting thing, right? We're going to have the dubious pleasure, I suppose, of growing up into... I laugh at how I think I'm still growing up. Right. I'm not. Um, <laughs> we have the pleasure of experiencing uh, a world um, which is populated not by um, human influences, but within the next dec decade, we'll be seeing synthetic influences. We will be having our opinion shaped by people who've never been born and never will be born. And they'll be giving voice to the agendas of commercial, governmental organizations uh, and changing the way that we think, feel, act. And we will become progressively less good at spotting these things because they will be embedded in the way that we are educated, the way that we consume entertainment, the way that we consume news and, and political shows. Um, you know, you, your, your Tom Cruise of the future won't have to work on one film at a time. All, all future Tom Cruise has to do is license out his face and the sound of his voice and AI can make seven, eight, 10, 20 films with him in all at the same time. He never has to go into a studio and act anymore. He just has to license out what he looks like. And in the future, there doesn't even have to be a Tom Cruise. We can just watch people in films, again, who've never been born and never will be. So we'll, have, we'll be in a society that's totally used to interacting with uh, AI-generated representations of famous people, family, people we respect, people we love, uh, so influence operations in that kind of world will have a much more significant uh, and long-term impact that the Facebook and Twitter campaigns of today will look like toys, sandpit, child's play. And I think for me, that's the future of warfare. It's warfare of the mind uh, and not warfare of, of the battlefield. And, and actually, when you think about it on time scales, I think that's potentially more scary than, than time-limited physical conflict. So I've been been looking at uh, the the COVID pandemic that has uh, kind of worked its way around the world, and how we were so focused on everything about COVID and and and, uh, and how that's really changed. We've had this period of introspection. We've actually sat back and and reevaluated our lives. Is is this where I wanted to be? Is this what I wanted to be doing? And 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 for a lot of people, they, they decided to shift gears and do something else. So that's had uh, a dramatic influence on how we think about the world. Now, with the, the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, that's that's also been a moment that caused people to sit back and reevaluate their life and their standing in the world and all that, and and so it looks like we're uh, we're radically um, uh, kind of resetting the standards, resetting what it what success looks like, what yeah. what motivates us, what gets us up in the morning, what uh, what a hero looks like, what a villain looks like, and and so it seems like we're we're giving rise to this whole new breed of storytellers that are going to kind of remap society from here on out, um, and and I think this this actually plays in in some real interesting ways and. Uh, how we proceed moving forward after this conflict ends, if if it ever does. I mean, I hope this doesn't turn into a thirty year war or something. Well, yeah. that is that is the trend. That's the going fashion. Or a hundred years war. We have one of those with France. <laughs> That's right. Um, my my biggest lesson from actually from the pandemic has been it made me realize quite how rapidly the unthinkable becomes or the unimaginable becomes normal. Mm -hmm. Things. Things that we would never have considered a regular or normal part of our lives uh, in January 2020 are very difficult to let go of now. Um, I remember my my first travel abroad, because I used to travel a lot pre, pre-COVID for work. I was traveling to different countries to speak at events and go to meetings and stuff. Uh, my first travel abroad was from here, from Poland, and I went to Norway to speak at my on my first stage at an event for since the, <laughs> the outbreak of, of COVID. Um, and there was an event on in the evening. Turns out in Poland, we were all still wearing masks everywhere. Right. Uh, and in Norway, they had stopped wearing masks some time before. And I've gone to the evening event. 
at the, the event where I was speaking, it was kind of okay because I'm on the stage and everyone else is far away and it was like, this is just normal. I'm not wearing a mask because everyone's a long way away from me. Uh, got to the evening event and it was, you know, people were drinking and dancing and having fun and there was music and people were coming up to me to talk to me. Uh, people I didn't know, but, oh, I saw your presentation, it was great. But they were this, you know, right. an inch from my face, shouting into my ears because of the music. I could feel their spit on my cheeks. <laughs> and I have never had that existential dread through being in close proximity to another human before. Right. But post-COVID, that's a thing. And it's a real deep-seated emotional thing. Um, so it's not even something as simple as just saying, hey, I'm wearing a mask and wow, that's normal and it didn't used to be normal. There are deep-seated emotional changes, I think, that all of us have gone through, which it will take some time for us to come out the other side of, if indeed we do, as a society in general. So we're we're coming to the the end of our uh, the podcast here. Um, is there any last thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? So one, one of the things that, that's really important to me, because my, my, my job is vice president of security research at Trend Micro, right? So my focus is on research. It's not in helping the company to sell more products or uh, you know, anything that's, that's commercial. It's about doing research that helps us build better technology, um, but also helps us to better educate um, those around us and the, the issues that we feel are of concern. So we did this project, Project 2030, where we tried to imagine the next 10 years of technological innovation uh, from the perspective of the individual, from the perspective of a, of a company and of a nation state. And actually, when we first decided to do the project, it was pre-pandemic. As we started to do all the preparation work, um, COVID was big and we had to change our plans and how we were doing it. And it figured, obviously, then in the scenarios that we drew in this research in the end. Um, when you're writing a big research paper like that, and, and I, with my co-author, co Vic Baines, um, we spent a long time talking, researching, writing, putting it all together. When you're writing and it's nearly 40 pages of research, you're immersed in the bit that you're writing right now, you're immersed in the research you're doing up front, and then when it's finished, you read through it for punctuation errors and grammatical errors and words that you misspelled or missed out, whatever it might be. And, it's not, and then it goes away for someone else to make it look pretty, and finally you get it back. And it wasn't until you get it, I got it back that you can sit and read it as a whole and say, what was I actually writing about here? What, what was, what's the overriding message uh, of this document, of this research? And probably it would be different for every reader. But for me, it was this, that our greatest struggle over the next decade will be um, the ability to tell fact from fiction, to tell um, uh, reality from fantasy, information from misinformation or disinformation. Uh, and right now we don't have um, the capabilities emotionally, uh, experientially or technically uh, to assist individuals or even enterprises and corporations in doing that. It's an area that is ripe for innovation, excuse me, ripe for innovation, uh, but also needs a significant focus on because without doubt it is our greatest struggle of the next decade helping individuals to distinguish what is real from what is unreal particularly as our world moves ever more towards a, a combined cyber physical world where anything you can imagine you can effectively see before your eyes we, we need as a society to work out what we're going to do to define real so and so we're moving from a world of false narratives to false narratives on steroids, um, essentially, which is a scary world to think about, actually. Um, or, or just a world where, where you get to define your own narrative um, and, and present it as truth. Um, right. it's, not, it's not even one that by necessity has to be false or, or, um, or malicious but it can be one that just is organically accepted as real because it's experienced as real for making sense. There. Yeah. So there's also the po possibility of rewriting everything in history as a result of that. One um, of the things we touch on in the research as just a little suggestion is uh, we, we say, oh, the United Nations, we're writing from the perspective of 2030. Um, the United Nations are trying to, uh, uh, put together resources to establish an objective, factual record of history. Um, but it is surprisingly difficult 
to get international agreement even on recent historical events. And this is before the war that we're currently living through right now. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The history books in the future will be, um, yeah, <laughs> there'll be a hodgepodge of, of fact and fiction and we won't know the difference. Absolutely. Well, listen, Rick, this has been an absolute pleasure to, to talk to you today, to find out about the situation that you find yourself in and uh, some of your thoughts on how this might move forward. I, I want to thank you for coming on our show, and uh, I wish you the best moving forward. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you now.